Money is not the only reason someone can be taken hostage. It's important to know the other motives for how and why targets are selected. Today's guest is Rachel Briggs. Rachel has spent the past two decades as a writer, analyst, and strategist working with corporations, governments, and international NGOs developing security. She was the first director of Hostage International and the founding executive director of Hostage U.S. Rachel co-chairs the European Commission's group that is working on tackling online extremism. The report she wrote, The Business of Resilience, has become the blueprint for corporate security management. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Great. Can you give myself and the audience a little bit of background about who you are and how you got involved in what you currently do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you rewind back to about 1996, 25 or so years ago, I was a first year university student at Cambridge University and got the rather unexpected news that a member of my family had been taken hostage in Colombia. Um, we are a very, very ordinary family. And so it was, it was a, a shocking bit of news. And what followed was seven months of never knowing if he was alive or dead or if we would ever see him again. And so it started for me, and, and thankfully I should say he did come out alive seven seven months later, um, but it started for me what has um, turned out to be a lifelong um, passion um, to work on hostage issues, to understand the crime, to support the folks who have been um, unfortunately affected by it, um, and to try to have an impact on public policy to help us make better decisions uh, in the future. So I helped to found Hostage International and Hostage US, two nonprofits that help families and hostages as they're going through and getting over hostage cases and have written lots and lots of stuff on, on hostage policy and, and continue to do so. That's awesome. It's uh, an unfortunate way to get into the field, but I'm glad that there are people that are in the field that are passionate about it. Absolutely. And it's a very tight knit family. You know, the, those of us who find our lives touched by this uh, brutal crime, um, we, we stick together and and um, it, it tends to stay with you. So, so let's so let's talk a little bit about kind of different types of hostage taking. What are what are some of the ways that this, this uh, plays out? Yeah. So I would I would really point to three different types of hostage taking. So I'll start with political hostage taking, which for somebody who grew up in the 1980s, um, my TV every single night, it seemed, was dominated by the Beirut hostage cases. In in my case, being a Brit, it was Terry Way, John McCarthy. Um, in For many of your listeners, they will have been uh, looking at Tom Sutherland and Terry Anderson and, and watching their plight. Um, and um, that's a typical kind of political kidnapping. It's where um, both Westerners and locals are taken by political or terrorist or political freedom fighter groups um, who take Westerners um, either to draw attention to their cause, to uh, perhaps uh, look for political concessions from, from Western governments. Um, so that's what I was familiar with. And, and as I mentioned, my own personal experience in 1996 with a family member who was taken in Colombia, that opened my eyes to um, a second type of hostage taking, which is economically motivated, um, criminal in one way or another, um, where hostages are no, nothing more than a commodity with a price on their head, frankly. And um, what I think most people don't realise is that actually they make up the majority of cases they tend to happen very quietly behind the scenes, but they constitute the majority of hostage take, hostage cases around the world. So um, the motivation is money. Um, as long as somebody is willing to pay, your loved one will come home. And if they're not, the, the outcome may not be as great. And then the third um, type of hostage case that I would point to, which has had more and more publicity in, in the last few years, is state hostage taking. Uh, um, so we think about um, the Westerners who are held in prison in Iran, uh, for example, in China, in Russia, for no other reason other than they are American, they are British, they are European. And um, those governments uh, understand that if they hold those Westerners for no good reason whatsoever, it, it creates a pressure and a negotiation point um, on the part of American and, and British and, and other governments. So political 
economic and and now I, I suppose we might call it hostage diplomacy is the third type. Gotcha. Are there particular uh, geographies where this happens more uh, more predominantly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Latin America has featured right up there at the top of the kidnap hotspots for as long as I remember. Um, when I was going through this 25 years ago as a family, Colombia was the kidnap capital of the world. Um, today, that unfortunate crown is held by Mexico, um, which I'm sure will be of much interest to your listeners who are holidaying in Mexico and may have family in Mexico. And it's not to say that the whole of Mexico is experiencing this, but certain parts of Mexico, this is a a really, really prolific crime. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of folks taken um, per year. So Mexico's at the top, various other parts of Latin America. And in those cases, that's that's mostly economically motivated. Um, when we look at the politically motivated, um, broadly speaking, you're looking at certain parts of the Middle East and, and Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the, the state hostage taking, which I mentioned, the, the key... The key protagonists there, the key um, the key governments that are engaged in that kind of activity are certainly Iran, China, Russia, North Korea, um, and, and a couple of others. So it's happening all over the place. Um, I guess the thing I would just mention is that you know it happens in countries like the United States as well. I mean that the FBI is busy retrieving domestic hostages as well as deploying its agents around the world to bring Americans um, home from 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 other countries. Um, mm -hmm but different in flavor and um, uh, different solutions. And are there particular uh, people that are targeted as, as targets of kidnapping and hostage taking? Yeah, there, I mean, there, there, are, um, there are certainly kind of usual suspects um, in this regard. And, and I'll start by talking about um, one particular group of, of hostages who are um, the, the sort of the brave folks who run towards danger while the run of a, while the rest of us sort of hide under the table and, and run away. So I think particularly of journalists, of humanitarian workers, and of, of religious missionaries who is part of their job description to to go to the the ends of the earth, the places that are most dangerous. Whether that's to bring stories back to help us understand the world, whether that's to bring aid and relief to folks who are suffering or, or to, to sort of share their, their faith with, with the rest of the world. And, you know, the interesting thing about that, and some of your listeners will have been, um, I guess, sort of very interested in the, the case from Haiti with, with the missionaries recently. The interesting thing there is, you know, over the last, if we'd have rewound 30 years ago, there were some cases involving those types of victims, but on the whole, it wasn't the thing to do. Mm -hmm. If you were a self self respecting hostage taker, you know, you you you, you left journalists and humanitarians and missionaries alone because they were good people doing good stuff. Um, unfortunately, that that just doesn't hold anymore, and um, so they find themselves targeted. Um, you know, one of the the most famous cases, of course, was the Americans and British hostages who were murdered by ISIS. Um, eight years ago, 2014, um, you know, journalists and, and humanitarian workers simply just trying to do the right thing um, in, a, in a dangerous part of the world. So that's the first group. Um, there's also a lot of what you might call unlikely hostages. Um, but I, as somebody who's in the business, I would know that they are very, very often, um, unfortunately, picked up. And and my family member would fall into that category. You know, he was an, an engineer working for a Danish company, going to Colombia to to look at the facilities that they were they were operating out there. A businessman, a, a, an engineer, a contractor. Um, you know, you think about the folks who went into Iraq after the the fall of the the um, of the regime there to help rebuild the country. There's folks doing that from the US, from Europe, um, going to those places uh, all over the world to, to sort of take their skills and their, uh, their knowledge um, for the benefit of, of the folks that are living out there. So um, business people, uh, business, business travelers in, in Mexico, uh, it's, a real, it's a real variety. And I think the idea that there is a certain type of person that is taken, um, is it just doesn't hold true anymore. The, the one thing that I would say is that um, for for some reason or another, there are many more men who are taken than than women. So I think we can say that this is a crime that um, target you know targets predominantly men rather than women. It may be because 
um, men take themselves to, to those parts of the world more often than women. I, I simply don't know. But I think that would be the only rule that I could I could really find in all of this. That's kind of interesting. I would have thought it would be the opposite, that if you're trying to uh, elicit sympathy and attention, that female targets would be um, more newsworthy. Gosh, I hate saying that, but like yeah. garner more attention and more publicity. Yeah, and I'm sure there are cases where that is that is so. Um, I mean, I think of, for example, Ingrid Bessencourt, who was held by the FARC in Colombia for, my goodness, I think six years. And um, there was there was a real power to holding her. You know, I mean, she also was a politician running for office in Colombia. But, you know, that I think for many people that was shocking. And um, and it, it sort of keeps the story alive, maybe in a way that it, it wouldn't have as emotively if that had been a man. But um, yes, women feature less often as, as hostages than men uh, as a whole. Would you, would you, where would you throw in, or maybe this is less frequent, like families traveling, people on vacation, just kind of the, the hiker who gets picked up, you know, uh, yeah. crossing the, the border in Iran while hiking inadvertently. Does, yeah. Is that uh, a much smaller contingent? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not to say it doesn't happen. And I, I can happily give you examples of people I know who have found themselves in that situation. So but it's but it's a it's a it's a much smaller it's a much smaller proportion. Um, I mean, one of the cases I'm very familiar with is a, a British woman called Judith Tebbett, who was on holiday in Kenya um, and was Somali pirates kind of traveled up the coast and picked her up from her. Um, idyllic holiday home and then took her back into Somalia. I mean, that's really going, you know, quite putting quite a lot of effort into to, to find a, a hostage. And um, there, of course, the American hikers who were picked up in Iran, goodness, 10, 15 years ago, you know, sort of wandered into the wrong place and, and then suddenly found themselves locked up and uh, pawns in a, again, in that hostage diplomacy um, uh, struggle between the US and Iran. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's a, not a good place to be in between governments arguing over things. You 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 become very small <laughs> when government when when you know the, the, those kind of governments around the table arguing. Yeah. So so once someone uh, kind of gets kidnapped, what can they expect on how they be treated and how the 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 money is requested? Yeah, I mean, in terms of how hostages are treated, I mean, it, it, the first thing to say is, of course, it's never pleasant um, to be held by bad people because it's, there's, you know, it's, it's bad folks who, who hold you against your will, never knowing whether you're going to see the next day or not, not being able to leave with your own free will. Um, so it's never it's never a pleasant experience. Um Exactly how you're treated really depends on the group that are holding you and how experienced they are and, and so on and so forth. You know, there are certainly many hostages I have spoken to who have dealt with um, very severe malnutrition because they have been fed very meager and um, uh, rations. There are those who've been tortured. There are those who've been beaten. Um, there, You know, th there's been some pretty nasty experiences Um and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a great place um, to be in. Is it kind of like, I know with uh, uh, electronic ransomware, there is this level of um, uh, for us to be trusted, for people to pay the ransom, there has to be some level of ethics, which sounds weird. Mm -hmm. And that if you pay the ransom, we're going to release your data. We're going to, you know, unencrypt your data is that same sort of thing exist with uh, hostage takers that like, well, we understand if that we're doing this for economic purposes, we have to treat uh, our targets with some level of, you know, we, we can't send them home super sick because then people won't pay as much. Like, it, it, yeah. are, there, are there kind of those considerations and how they treat hostages based on why they're taking them? Well, it's a really good question, actually, because if you go back to if we start with the, the economically motivated cases and they, they will not all be like this. But essentially, it's really hard work to hold somebody for a prolonged period of time without getting caught. Mm -hmm. So if you want to if you want to move from being a one time hostage taker 
to a professional hostage taker who can not just do this once, but can do this over and over again, perhaps holding multiple hostages at the same time. You you need to operate as a business, right? And and if if you, you know you need to generate a reputation that if I negotiate fairly for hostage A, that I have some expectation that hostage A is going to come home because then if I'm also nego- negotiating six months later for hostage B, I have to trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. So again, if I take this back to my own family's experience, um, I remember at, at the time, and certainly I've heard this many times since, you know, negotiating to get Western hostages out of Colombia at that point in time, it was not always easy, but there were rules. Mm-hmm. And, the you know, there was a dance that was danced between the hostage takers and the negotiators and the diplomats where everybody kind of knew how it was going to play out. And I remember at some point being told by the negotiators that were working um, to free my relative, you know, we're expecting, you know, one to two months of silence now. Um, and I remember being horrified. And it, it, it's I mean, it's one of the worst things you deal with as a family is the hearing nothing. But sure enough, we had two months of silence because they knew how it worked. And there was a pattern and everybody had to play the game to to that's how you build up trust. It's the same as when you run a business. I mean, you have to be predictable and um, and so on and so forth. So um, the extent to which that extends to a hostage's treatment. I mean, sure, if I if if I don't end up coming out because I'm injured badly, um, that that will be a consideration. Um, but certainly there are for, for many groups who are wanting to sustain this as an ongoing activity and want to be paid for it. Um, as as absurd as it sounds to have a conversation of this nature, um, they there are rules of the game. And um, I mean, the most the most dangerous uh, person or group to get taken by is a first time hostage taker who's scared and terrified and overreacts and is trigger happy. And um, that's the most dangerous place you can find yourself in as a hostage. Someone who's trying to figure it out for the first time. Yeah. And is very scared and therefore their adrenaline is going and they are jumpy and um, they, they don't, they're they're not thinking about the next case. They're just thinking about this one. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, they're taking risks and, and so on. So, so once there's, you know, some negotiating going on, do you know the percentages of uh, people that don't survive versus those that are released versus those that are actually able to escape? Because I think yeah. in Haiti, some of them were able to escape at the end. Yeah. So unfortunately, the statistics on hostage taking are, are really poor. Um, I mean, all crime statistics are, are are you know underreported right but this is this is one of those crimes where the statistics sort of very much lie behind the scenes um governments have a disincentive to reveal to the world how many of their citizens are taken each year because yeah. it's a mark of um something they're not exactly proud of um the the private negotiation firms that that exist very legitimately um don't don't have an incentive to to necessarily share their own statistics mm-hmm. um, and families who handle it on their own have nowhere to report their statistics. So yeah. um, the statistics are, are, are not great. Um, I would say that um, certainly we do know that if you're an American who's taken by a terrorist group, your chances of coming out alive are considerably lower than if you're a European held by a terrorist group, because I mean, let's go back to the cases in Syria in 2014 it's it's widely understood that the European governments paid and the Brits and the Americans didn't and they don't. And they, they do tend to hold firm on that. So um, unfortunately, we as, as Brits and Americans um, do not tend to fare as well in those cases. Um, and if you are working for a company that has um, all the right resources and support on hand and a relationship with a negotiation company and you're taken um, in an economically motivated case, your, your chances of coming out are, are pretty high. Mm-hmm. So how does that play out where you've got a hostage negotiation organization or government or you know maybe it's even working governments working through other entities? How does that kind of what does that process play out like? Yeah, so that's probably a question I can't answer because I'm not I'm not a negotiator, so I might skip that if that's okay. <laughs> that's that that's quite all right. 
I'm I, glad we rehearsed that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll edit this out. Excellent. Um, let's let's talk about so how much of of an impact and is it a do you, your personal opinion is it a good policy for let's say UK and US governments having this position of this blanket the official I'll call it that way the official policy of we don't negotiate yeah and and you know their their position is that they don't they don't offer concessions to terrorists so they they can be dialogue but they're in for Americans and Brits can be no payment um that those that's their government policy um so listen i understand where it comes from and as a position and as a as a theoretical response to hostage taking it makes all kind of sense to yeah. me if hostage takers are economically motivated and we stop paying them it will end hostage taking right it makes inherent sense the problem is that ransoms are the hardest thing to control in a hostage case and why is that because of the nature of the crime yeah so if if god forbid somebody takes my husband i will do anything I have to to get him home. I will sell our home. I will remortgage. I will beg, borrow and steal from friends and family. And that's what pretty much all of us would do because it, it, it's that kind of crime. It's a, it's playing on our vulnerabilities and our love and our the, the very essence of being human, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, um, and we know this because there has been controlled experiments of this, the governments of both Colombia and Italy um, went through the process of making ransom payments illegal to stop the, the proliferation of hostage taking in their own countries. Surprise, surprise, it didn't work because what happened was um, if you were a family who had somebody taken, you just didn't report it to the authorities. Yeah. And you dealt with it off the book and you had to go underground to deal with it. So it made, made it more dangerous for, for the hostage and more dangerous for the family. Um, and the, there was less of an understanding of the crime. So, I mean, my starting point is I do understand why the policy is in place. I do I completely agree that it is it's it's distasteful, to say the least. The idea of paying money to terrorists yeah. abhors me as much as it does anybody. Um, if the question is, what could we do to stop kidnapping? If that was our starting point. I don't think we'd go anywhere near the issue of ransoms. You know, the, the countries that have successfully ended their own domestic issues have not done that by stopping ransom payments because it doesn't work. They've done it by dismantling the groups. They've done it by, you know, cutting down the group's areas of operation. They've done it by creating different incentives so that local communities have different ways of making money have an incentive to get involved in the legal economy rather than the illegal economy. So you you sort of you push the you push the problem away by by sort of offering incentives rather than um, trying to, to to limit that. So I understand where it comes mm -hmm. from, but it just doesn't work, unfortunately. And so if we're serious about ending hostage king, we have to look at this from a different angle, learn from what has worked and not worked elsewhere. And um, while I while I completely understand why those governments will continue to um, have that stance publicly, I think I think behind the scenes we need to start getting a lot more creative with uh, the effort that we put into tackling the the factors that could really make a difference. The the, the underlying reasons of why the kidnappings are happening in the first yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. The causes rather than than the symptoms. Yeah. Gotcha. So. When it comes to hostage releases, without uh, the specifics of how the negotiations play out, what are kind of the, the different ways that hostages are released? Kind of what mm. what, what, are, what are the <laughs> what are the mechanisms that might happen? Yeah, so I guess the the first and foremost would be the handover of money, and um, you know, in the old days, that would have been a, a you know hold all of cash. Um, in some parts of the world, that will still be the way to do it. Um, in, in others, there will be electronic means or cryptocurrencies. Yeah. 
um, all sorts of new and you know criminals are using technology. I, I suspect more effectively than the rest of us are. Yeah. Um, so um, that that will be that will be one, and that will be the predominant way that um, you know that that point of release happens. Mm-hmm. Um, we also, in some cases, see you know good old prisoner swaps. Um, I mean, a, just just last year, I think there was a, a Canadian academic who was released from Iran, um, and you know, it was reported uh, very publicly that she had been released in in exchange for some Iranians who who were being held elsewhere. You know, so those kind of prisoner swaps most certainly do still happen. Um, and, and those, and then, and those you know, generally sorry. tend to be more when it's like state sponsored or political oriented, right? Yeah, it, almost, almost exclusively. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, there's, there's also, I mean, there's, there's kind of strange outlying cases. I mean, you'll remember the Americans who were released um, from Iran at the start of 2016 when the Iran, Iran, can't say it, Iran nuclear um, negotiations came to a to a conclusion, and there was a bunch of Americans who came back. So there's also there's also examples of sort of policy negotiations that can that can bring people home as well yeah oh and i should also say there are there are some folks who who escape you know that it's very rare um it's very dangerous but i i could certainly um, name some former hostages i know who managed to find managed to find their way out and and i assume there are you know maybe uh, television programs play it up a bit but i'm sure there are that are rescued by military operations Absolutely, absolutely, and actually, right now we're we're about to sort of mark the tenth anniversary um, of Jessica Buchanan being kidnapped in Somalia, American, who was uh, an aid worker in Somalia, and she, you might remember, she was rescued by SEAL Team Six. She was held for a couple of months, and then um, the the US SEAL Team Six very bravely went in and um, secured her her release. So yes, again, those are the kinds of um, resolutions that that also are very dangerous, which is why they don't happen very often. You know, the amount of intel that a SEAL Team Six would need to be really confident that not only could they get the hostage out safely, but they can safely send those guys in without um, sort of putting undue and unnecessary risk onto to folks who, you know, um, face it quite enough risk in their jobs anyway. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it makes for a sexy television plot, but. Uh probably not so much in reality very scary very scary as i as i understand it yeah so so what are some of the things that that people can do to uh, reduce their chances of being kidnapped yeah so listen i mean there are some there are some really basic stuff basic things you can do so um you know the the U, the us government like the uk and others have really good travel advisories actually and they've got more and more detailed over the years and they you know they do routinely list the risk of kidnap um to by country so there's some information sources you consult consult you know we talked earlier about mexico now clearly not every single place in mexico is a kidnap hotspot yeah. um go to the state department website and it will help you figure out Where's a nice place to go and drink cocktails on a beach? And perhaps where is a, a part of Mexico where you, you may not want to be traveling independently? So um, consult those information sources. There's some really basic stuff which doesn't just apply to hostage taking, but to crime in generally. So, you know, don't wear an expensive watch. Don't wear loads of expensive jewelry that makes you stand out as being a wealthy, a wealthy foreigner, um, you know, don't drive around after dark in, in dangerous areas. Um, I mean, some of this is, is is in a sense is basic personal yeah. safety and security. Um, once, of course, you're being sent to certain parts of the world where the risk is part of what you take on, then, of course, you, you definitely need much more specialist help, mm-hmm. potentially some um, security guards um, and, and very sort of um, specific security um sort of protection um to to keep to make sure you you stay safe mm-hmm. and what kind of services are like i assume it's, it would be super specialized are there kind of insurance policies for kidnapping and ransom there is there is a thing called kidnap and ransom insurance um the market has been going for absolutely decades it actually um sprang up in the 1930s 
um, not long after the Lindbergh baby was mm. was kidnapped in in the U.S. as a sort of a the the that insurance market um, was created, but didn't really take off until the 1960s and 70s when um, you know Western companies were really starting to to move out and about in the world and take themselves off to more interesting parts in search of uh, business expansion and so on. So yes, there is a there is a thriving kidnap and ransom insurance industry. Um, it also has alongside it um, specialist negotiators who tend to be tied to particular underwriters. So if you get a policy with this underwriter, you will have uh, be guaranteed that you'll have the help of a particular um, a kidnap and run, kidnap response. Um, firm. Um, so yeah, there's there's a quite a well developed um, market um, here, um, and it you know it it sort of seems controversial in some ways, but in others, you know it's it's a risk. It's it's one risk, just like I have home insurance in case we're broken into. Um, you know, some we take travel insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's about it's about protecting yourself and um, and your employees if if they're doing business around the world. And I assume that would be more common for, oh, let's say like oil exploration companies that are, you know, that have large, large bank roles that can afford to pay for an insurance policy as opposed to some local church, which is sending a single missionary to Haiti yeah. or something like that. Yeah. I mean, these are not cheap policies. I mean, a, a very large majority of, um, you know, Fortune 500, FTSE 500 companies have this insurance. We, we, we know that from the market. Um, I mean, interestingly, one of the things that has been emerging since the Syria cases in 2014 is um, there are there are a number of groups who are trying now to provide insurance, kidnap and ransom insurance for freelance journalists, for example. So, you know, ensuring that the loan loan journalists, um, loan missionaries are not, you know, or very small organizations are not priced out of the protection that larger um, organizations can can get. And that's a really, really great development. Yeah. Kind of a, a, a group policy for insure, for for journalists. Some I don't know exactly <laughs> how it works, but I think it's great. And, you know, the, the one of the important things about those policies is that you get some of your premium back each year to, to spend on security mm-hmm. and to spend on security training. So they are an attempt. They're not perfect, but they're an attempt to um, both – uh, secure and um, educate uh, the policyholders, which is is a win for the underwriters, of course, because it minimises your risk. But it's also a win for you as a policyholder because you get access to that expert um, security and, and training and education. Mm-hmm. So, so from from your personal experience, once your uncle was released and and during the process, what's the what's the impact on the family? And are there uh, is like host- is, does your organization help with kind of the emotional psychological support of the family and the the victim so the experience of a family i mean everybody's different every case is different um uh what i came to understand having gone through this myself with my own family and then working with hundreds of and hundreds of families both with hostage international and hostage us which i I don't work with anymore, uh, but their their excellent work continues, um, is that there's so many commonalities. You know, each case might be unique, but there's common threads. And, you know, when you when you try to imagine what would it be like for a family going through this, you you can immediately imagine it must be scary. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, and of course it is. I mean, and that's not to underestimate how scared you are when you're going through this. But actually, human beings can't be scared all the time. I mean, we have our brain does wonderful things that helps us carry on with life. And um, so we can't be scared all the time. Um, The way in which I think that really impacts us, though, when we go through something like this is that it does things like it stops us sleeping. And, you know, there is a reason that sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture, because it is devastating. You know, if, if we just consistently for weeks, months at a time, do not get enough sleep, it, ha- it actually has physical impact on our ability to concentrate, our ability to, you know, operate heavy machinery, as we all, as we all know, um, I joke, but, but, you know, it, it really is, is quite a debilitating. Um, so your ability to hold down a job might be impaired, your ability to manage your family's finances may 
they just go out of the water. And so by the time you get the hostage home, you'll be very pleased to have him or her home, but you're facing all sorts of financial problems because you you weren't able to concentrate on them. Um, so it's a very it's a very unique experience. Um, it's also we talked earlier about um, the the not knowing and the silence. I mean, I mentioned our experience of having months of of silence, um, and that is is rattling. I mean, it really rattles you. And when when you're not being told anything, when there's no news, your brain starts to fill in the gaps. Mm-hmm. And usually your imagination is worse than reality. And that's a form of, of torture in its in its own right. Um, and then, you know, there's there's the sort of the, the the boring but essential realities of everyday life that can be really difficult to manage. You know, you know, folks who have kids, um, folks who've got to hold down a job, folks who've got to look after the finances. Um, there's there's really weird things that can happen, you know, in a lot of families, the main breadwinner might be the main signatory on the bank account and the insurance policies. And, you know, as, as, as silly as it might seem, the number of families I've helped where, you know, the husband has been taken hostage and the wife has a, you know, maybe just a very minor car accident and calls the insurance company. And the first question they ask you is, can I speak to the policyholder? And the answer is no, they've been kidnapped. The answer is no. And I can't tell you why I, uh, you can't yeah. speak to them. You know, so it's it's that double whammy of, you know, and unfortunately there's no sort of, you know, press three if the policyholder is a hostage and press two if I mean it's it's just it's not one of the options on the drop down menu. So um it's it's I suppose the easiest way for people to relate to it is imagine a member of the family sort of suddenly being in a in a coma mm-hmm. and not being able to sign anything and um not being able to to be part of you know, dealing with financial issues and mortgages and policies. And um, so it's, you know, it's some of that stuff, which is would be difficult to deal with at the best of times. But if you're also not sleeping yeah, and you're terrified and you're anxious and you're worried that your kids aren't doing well and you're worried about the impact on them, it's it's just it's a real um, it's a perfect storm, really, for for family collapse. And are do some of these companies help provide support and resources for the families? Yeah, so I would. I mean, the first thing I would point to is organisations like Hostage International and Hostage US, who they go through this every day of every year with multiple, multiple families. So th- there's always a day in the office when a colleague from those organisations see, you know, comes across a challenge that they haven't seen before, but th- they've seen most of it before, and they they really do kind of help families to anticipate what might come next, to anticipate, you know, what could you do today that might stop a problem becoming a problem in, in a month's time or six months time? Um, and they also have access to all sorts of specialists who can kind of come in and and, and help families. Um, the, the other thing is that, you know, there are one of the, the, the sort of privileges I've had over the years is going into big multinationals and training them. Um, on how do you look after a family if you have an employee taken? And there's some really good practices that are emerging within corporate America, um, big corporations who realize it's a risk and want to ensure that they've got all of their resources aligned so that if it does happen to one of their employees, they really can do the best by the family that they are supporting back home. And they and they've thought about it in advance so that they have the resources immediately available, as opposed to let's go out and find a good resource. Exactly, exactly. And and you know the the challenge is that um, you know for many organi- for any big organisations they have employee assistance programs, which gives them a sense of comfort that they're covered. But of course, the psychologist on your employee assistance program probably hasn't dealt with, you know, a hostage case previously. So they're great at what they do, but they're not set up for these kind of special, very specialist problems where you need very specialist solutions. So that's where organizations like Hostage International and Hostage US are just, they just bring, you know, gold dust. They're like gold dust. (laughs) You know, they're so, it's so important in these scenarios. Gotcha. So, so I wondered how does uh, I, I've seen a lot of reports of kind of the rise of, of virtual kidnappings, whether it's okay. blackmail or where they actually are blackmailing the person into 
saying they've been kidnapped, so to speak, or that, you know, it's just the, I'm calling grandpa and I've kidnapped your kid from college yet the kids, you know, happily in his science class. Mm. Have you, do you have much familiarity with the, the virtual kidnappings and how those play out? I mean, these are extraordinary cases. Um, now, at my time with both Hostage International and Hostage US, I didn't deal with um, any of these directly. I, I have no idea if, if those organizations have um, since. Um, but we heard a lot about these kind of cases, sort of. And you hear about them kind of quietly behind the scenes. You know, they are they are covered um, by some of these insurance policies because, of course, they they generate losses and they they have costs associated with them. Um, but they they they're really underreported um, because often the folks who are impacted are then so embarrassed yeah. that they don't want to come forward because they feel really foolish that they acted out of love and out of emotion to because they thought a loved one was was at danger in danger and it turns out as you say they were in the maths class or they were on a a flight or they were you know driving to to visit um, a friend so um they it's it's a really pernicious crime it's definitely rising i mean the fbi doesn't um explicitly record uh, statistics on virtual kidnapping it would sit within its extortion um uh, number set. But between 2019 and 2020, the number of extortions that the FBI uh, recorded went up by 76 percent. Wow. So you've got to imagine that this is this is part of that. And certainly the trends that we're seeing is um, that um, it's, you know, what ha- what started as being a sort of an occasional that is getting more and more elaborate. It's getting um, more organized and um, you know the thing about it is because there's a speed element to it because yeah. within a few hours I'm going to figure out that my son is in his maths class um, you know it's usually lower amounts of money as, you know trying to get a transaction very very quickly but I I think it's something that we all need to watch um, and that will will only increase in the years to come yeah I, sus- I suspect that that sort of thing there'll be a rise in it over over the few years over the next few years as uh, as just another means to a, a financial end for people it's yeah you know it's, it's one thing if you're a first time kidnapper and you're taking someone hostage physically you've got the person you're trying to deal with negotiations you you're worried about whether it's a reality or not you're worried about the police or seal team 6 showing up at your front door if it's a virtual kidnapping you could be you know anywhere on the internet and not necessarily, well, the, the person's not physically with me, so no one's yeah. going to be beating down my door. Exactly. But, hey, here's here's one thing that I would um, sort of just a, a thought to leave you you and your listeners with about virtual kidnapping is because, of course, it, it sort of seems like it's a, almost a victimless crime, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. somebody is losing a few thousand dollars. So, of course, there's, there is a victim in that sense. But it feels it feels like the, there's much less victimhood yeah. involved yeah. in it. Um what I do know, and I have heard from from the folks who've worked on these cases, is that the psychological impact oh, yeah. on those people who have been duped um, can be can be quite significant and quite long lasting. Um, and, you know, partnered with the fact that they then don't feel able to speak about it because they're embarrassed and ashamed. Mm-hmm. Um, really. So I think more awareness of this and a more understanding. It could happen to any of us. We're all human. We all would jump to to help our loved ones yeah. if we thought they were in danger. Um, so I think the more that we talk about this, I, I think the better. Absolutely. So as as we wrap up uh, with this episode, any parting advice for the audience? Well, I would say um, bear in mind that this is still, thankfully, a very rare crime. It's more common than we would think. There's mm-hmm. probably about 200 Americans a year taken overseas each year, but um, it is it is. Um, less common than you know it's, it's not a hugely common crime which is a good thing um the 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 after effects do last a long time and i guess i would encourage your audience to get curious you know when uh, this is how i used to be you know i would read the stories in the newspapers and you sort of give it a cursory surface level um sort of read but but really kind of when you read those stories just pause and just give a, a moment's thought for the people who are behind them and imagining what they're what they're going what they're going through. 
That's great advice. Uh, so where can people find you online and what are you doing these days? Yeah. So, um, so I, people can find me online at the clarity factory.com clarity um, I also have a personal blog, which is Rachel Briggs.org. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Rachel Briggs UK. So clarity factory.com Rachel Briggs.org and Rachel Briggs UK on Twitter. Awesome. We'll make sure to uh, link to all of those in the show notes. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the easy pray podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Pray Podcast. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Rachel Briggs can be found at easypray.com slash 109.